Hi everybody, uh, I'm Rick Rollins and welcome to our little car barn here. Uh, I've been a member of the Checkered Flag 200 Peterson group for a long time and it's really fun to invite everybody here. So let's kind of walk down and see what the, uh, the earliest cars are in our little barn here. You know, when uh, most people come here, they realize that I have car ADD because I like pretty much everything, but I really like to uh, focus and appreciate the engineering and performance of every era of car. So I'd like to show you a couple things here. <clears throat> this is a 1908 Packard called a Gentleman's Roadster. This car was sold new in San Francisco and it lived its early life in the Bakersfield area. And then in 1928, it was uh, owned by Earl C. Anthony, who did a publicity stunt, went from LA to Oakland and back nonstop. They had a refueling truck of pictures of the whole thing. And uh, I restored it to look like it would have in 1928. So uh, this is kind of faux patina to make it look like an early car. It's a great, great early automobile. Packards were the best. <clears throat> Go over here. This is a simplex. It's a uh, double chain drive simplex. Probably the finest car in America in 1912. This car was made new in Manhattan, right in downtown New York City. And it was a chassis and then you had a custom body built for it. This is 600 cubic inches in four cylinders. So it was really kind of a road going locomotive. Uh, pretty special cars, simplexes. This is a Model T. Everybody has to own a good Model T in their collection if they're a real car guy. And this is a 1912 Depot hack. Uh, this is a car my dad and I built when I was 15 years old. I've been doing this forever. I started out building the little plastic car models and uh, we lived up by uh, LA and I'd get my dad to drive me by Shelby's when they had all the Mustangs and Cobras out in the yard. So I really, I don't know why, but it was a passion since I was a little kid. In any event, he and I built this car together from parts. And I thought we were building a car, but we were really trying to learn how to work together. And it was really a wise thing on his part. And uh, it's a very special thing for me. Um, in more of the early sport era. Uh, this is a Mercer raceabout, built in 1920. And these were built for rich Ivy League kids. They were considered the first American sports car built in Trenton, New Jersey. And they're fabulous, great performance. And uh, this is a, an L head Mercer. Uh, you can see how the seats are staggered so you can fit, a, uh, fit two people in a narrower body. The gas tank one part of it is gas and one part's oil for racing and uh, they have big fillers so they can quickly refuel and it's basically a, a sports racing car you could buy right off the showroom floor uh, in 1920. They're really great things. Um, these are some photos back here of uh, this is a Mercer race about in uh, Golden Gate Park same exact era and these are photos of uh, Bugattis at the uh, Monaco Grand Prix, which uh, I've tried to kind of show some of the cars in action. Uh, this is a interesting car. This is called the Winfield Two Up and Two Down Special. A guy named Ed Winfield built this car uh, in the late 20s. He was a genius and he changed uh, the engine of a Model T with a special crankshaft and a camshaft it's called a two up and two down special. So the front two pistons go up and the back two go down at a time. And he claimed to do 132 miles an hour at the Culver City board track in 1928. So I've driven it about 75 and it's terrifying. This is another Model T based car. Uh, I bought the remains of this car in a, in a, from a farm in Nebraska and uh, I built it to resemble an early Miller. So it's kind of a Miller Model T. So this is where I got my start building 
or doing these early Model T race cars, which were uh, <clears throat> really a fun part of the culture of automobiles in the early 20s. Kids could build them from parts uh, that they would uh, get at a junkyard or buy at uh, auto parts stores. And they had races, dirt track races at uh, county fairgrounds for the horse racing track. So it really got a lot of young guys, kids, in, involved in racing at an early age. This is a Type 37A Bugatti. Um, I always wanted to own a Bugatti and this is a real dream come true. This is a, just a fabulous car to drive. Uh, it's a four cylinder overhead cam supercharged. And Bugatti was really a, he was an artist, he was a sculptor, he was a genius mechanic. And his concept was to build a small displacement, lightweight car, a race car, uh, and then they morphed into, you could uh, run them on the street also. So kind of a sports racing car. This car has a great history. I've driven it many, many times at the Monterey Historics. And uh, it's, I'm honored to own it. It's a great thing. Kind of in keeping with that theme, I really enjoyed the early supercharged era. So this is a Bugatti, um, a three supercharged cars from three different countries. Bugatti is obviously from France. And this Alfa Romeo, obviously from Italy. <clears throat> and it was a supercharged car. This is six cylinder, dual overhead cam. I'll open this side of the motor for you. So this car was more designed for the street, although they did race them, the Milamia and Targa Florio. But uh, just to me, a real work of art as well. I mean, you look at the castings and the quality of, of everything, and, but a little more of creature comforts than a Bugatti. You know, the full fenders has a little top, so you can actually drive it somewhere without being totally exhausted. My wife and I took the Bugatti on the uh, California Miele, and she's a really great sport. Dr drove a, a thousand miles in that car and barely enough room to even put your feet in it. So, segue over here to a Bentley. So the Bugatti's 31, the, the, I'm sorry, the Bugatti's 1926, the Alpha's 1931, this is 1929, and this is a four and a half liter Bentley that's had a blower put on it. It's not one of the original blower cars, there's only 50. But in any event, uh, W.O. Bentley's concept was just to make a really big, heavy, road-going, powerful automobile. So, you know, the Bugatti is a, a one and a half liters and and the, the Alpha is 1750, and this is 4.5 liters. So a much bigger engine, much bigger everything. And there's just three different countries, three different people's concept on how to make an early performance sport car, sports car. Uh, we'll go over here to Rosal Raceland a little bit. Uh, this is a Silver Ghost, 1921. It's the earliest surviving Springfield-built Rolls-Royce. Uh, most people don't realize that uh, uh, Rolls built a factory in Springfield, Massachusetts uh, because they couldn't provide enough production for the American market. And besides that, uh, there were very high import duties on automobiles. So this, was, this car, most of the parts were shipped over from England and it was assembled at the factory from uh, parts from England. As they got uh, longer into their production, into the mid-20s, almost everything was built in the United States. But a great car. It's been a uh, Los Angeles car its whole life. And this was actually the first Rolls-Royce to ever go into Yosemite Valley. And their, uh, the early Rolls-Royce uh, advertising books showed this car in Yosemite Valley. I just found that out 
this year, as a matter of fact, so it's pretty cool. <clears throat> this is a Phantom One Rolls Royce, which is the car after the Silver Ghost. And this is a really interesting car, in my opinion, because uh, John Ford, the movie director, bought this car new in 1928. And he bought it for his wife. It's in his autobiography. Bought it for his wife because he went to the Philippines on a freighter with a bunch of crazy guys and did a bunch of bad stuff. And so when he came back, he, this is how he made it made up to her, was buying her this car. And he actually went to the dealer on Sunset Boulevard and he wasn't dressed very well and he was opening the door and they chased him out. They said, Let's, hey, you bum, get out of here. What are you doing? This is a $19,000 car. You could buy a house in Hollywood for $19,000 in those days. Well, the next day, this, his uh, agent or manager went back and said, what are you doing? That guy was going to buy that car. That's John Ford. And he said, okay, well, what can we do to make it up to him? He said, you can put a mink coat in the back seat and deliver it to his wife tomorrow. And they did. So this car, when we got it, was painted black and it had some really cheapy studio paint on it. And we didn't really understand. And we started messing around with little plastic uh, paint scrapers and the paint was just flaking off. Well, it turns out it was painted for a 1940 John Wayne movie called The Long Voyage Home. And it was a funeral scene, so they painted it black and used the car. Well, we spent about six months and very carefully got all that cheap black paint off and this is the original paint that was on the car. The car is a complete time warp. Uh, everything's ori original. The, the wiring, I, I, that's a lie. I had to replace two hoses because they disintegrated. But in any event, the wiring, the uh, top, all of the uh, varnish, carpet, upholstery, everything is original. I and mean, it's really an amazing thing. He kept it until 1972 when he had cancer and he sold the car. And I think it's a really very special, special car. Okay, let's segue over here. <clears throat> I love original paint stuff. And uh, I found this truck. It's an original paint, original upholstery. 1939 Ford pickup. Nothing real special, but it just has such a great patina and soul to it. And uh, I painted this on the side, the Balboa Island Speed Shop. It's kind of a fun little deal. And then uh, I put my 1912 Excelsior motorcycle in the back of it, along with a, a box from, from Excelsior. And it just makes kind of a fun little thing to take to car shows. And people are always kind of excited to see that. Um, next to it, 1938 Woody and <clears throat> Ford, obviously. And this car, we've owned it forever. My wife, Lucy, uh, would take the kids on car to carpool with it, take the kids surfing, throw the surfboards on top and go surfing. And uh, you know, it's hard to beat a good old flathead. And everybody likes a car like this. It's a car people can relate to. And a Woody is a fun, fun thing to have. Um, this is a 1964 Corvette Stingray. Not a very exciting year because everybody wants a split window, uh, which was 63. And it's the lowest horsepower. And it's a three-speed, which is pretty bizarre, but I bought it from the original owner who bought it as a gift for himself the day he got his PhD from Harvard in, ast in astronomy. And he was really a cool guy that lived in West LA. And he saved every piece of paper, the window sticker, the letter that he sent to the dealer when he ordered it. And it's just a really, really fun thing. And when I took it to uh, Corvette meet to get it judged, all the guys that are the judges wanted to put it up on a rack and look at every little detail because this car has never been messed with at all. It's, uh, it's a really fun thing to own and to drive. Again, original paint, original upholstery, original everything. This car I've owned for a long time. It's a uh, 
65 Cobra 289 and <clears throat> it's been repainted but it does have the original upholstery and uh, it's a very very special car to me uh, when I bought it I called the previous owner to find out a little information about the car and he said you know uh, when I sold it to the guy you're buying it from I kept the original hard top, the soft top, and some different parts for the car. And I always felt kind of bad about that. And so if you'd like to have them, um, I'll give them to you. So uh, it was very nice of him to actually marry the really important parts back up to the car and had a lot of, a lot, a lot of fun. It's really hard to beat a 289 Cobra. These big photos here are interesting. Uh, my dear friend, Ann Bothwell, who passed away at 98 years old, uh, she and her husband collected these two cars along with a lot of other cars, but this one on the right here <clears throat> is a Benz, called a Prince Henry model. Actually restored it for her and got to take it to Goodwood with her. And that's Barney Oldfield and Ty Cobb, the famous baseball player in the car. This is a Peugeot that she owned, and this is, a, this is Art Klein in 1919 at the Indy 500. You can see the brickyard. And Art Klein is the one that uh, Lindley Bothwell purchased the car from directly. And it's probably one of the most historic early race cars that exists. Uh, first cars with dual overhead cam, really genius built by a, designed by a gentleman named Ernst Henry. Uh, this is the only new car I bought in a long, long time, a C8 Corvette. I love this thing. It's has fabulous engineering to it, really well thought out. Performance is great. Uh, just a blast to drive. <clears throat> It's a 67 VW bus, and again, everybody can relate to a VW bus. We take it up to Pebble Beach every year. We spend the week up there and we drive it around. You could have a Duesenberg or the fanciest McLaren or whatever, and you drive this down the street and everybody can relate to this, loves it. You know, jumps out in front of you, gives you the peace sign, and everybody wants to check it out. It's just, we've had more fun Sit, sitting in there, uh, having lunch, playing 1967 music. It's a blast. Um, 1946 teardrop trailer. So there was a, right after the war, they sold a lot of these funky little trailers and you pull it behind whatever you had. And uh, there's teardrop camp clubs and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, obviously a couple of 356 Porsches. This is a uh, 57, uh, and it's a super sunroof, and uh, in the original colors. And this is my favorite color, aquamarine, non-metallic, and with a red interior. And those are the colors the car came with, and I, I fell in love with it. I had, couldn't resist buying it. A 56 Speedster, I've owned for about 40 years, 45 years, and uh, my wife and I drove it on the Colorado Grand, and you know it's hard to beat an early 356 for fun. <clears throat> this is a baby Bugatti, and uh, these cars were built at the factory. And uh, kind of an interesting story that Bugatti built one for his son, and then the King of Morocco came and bought a car. He wanted one for his son. So they ended up making a couple of hundred of these, and uh, it's very beautifully detailed. This is original paint, upholstery, tires, which is the way I like to get stuff. And uh, there's a book that just came out about baby Bugattis. They all have serial numbers and there's a whole cult following around that thing. Um, this is one of my favorite cars. This is an original paint, 73 Carrera RS, number 187. Uh, it was a fluke that I found it. I went to look at a, another uh, Formula Junior 
a race car that somebody had for sale. And uh, that's when I was doing Formula Junior racing. And I saw this over in the corner under a cover and I saw the duck tail. I said, what's that? He said, well, he started to explain it. And uh, I had to really stretch to buy it. I mean, compared to what they're worth now, it wasn't that big a deal, but uh, there are just not very many original paint Carrera RSs in a great color. Um, these lights were installed at the factory. It was built by account from, for account from Luxembourg who bought it at the Paris Auto Show. And uh, again, I'm, I'm the caretaker of that. It's a car that is very, very special. <clears throat> this is a little 911 hot rod that my son Grant and I built together. And it's just, you take a 911T and we did what they did in the, in the old days. Um, stripped it, lightened it. Um, we had a 2.5 liter motor built and put all 911S suspension and upgraded everything. Very, very fun to drive. Um, this is the newest car we have uh, purchased in the collection. And when I was in high school, I was in love with this car. I called it pea soup green, but it was, uh, it's called golden green. This is a 69 911E, and this is all original paint. Again, another time warp car, original paint, upholstery, of course, all numbers matching and all that stuff. And uh, this era of, of uh, 911 Porsche, kind of the jo jelly bean color era, I think is really interesting. It's a reflection on the times that they had all these great wild colors in those days. And think about it now, we're pretty much down to white, silver, black, and gray. And it's just, sometimes it's a reflection on the state of the economy or the world or whatever. But I love this era of these really colorful cars. Some interesting photos up here. A friend of a friend of mine took this photo of Janis Joplin in her wildly painted 356, which has recently surfaced and is in a collection back east now. But uh, he was just walking down the street with his Pentax camera in black and white film, and he saw her, yelled at her, and she waved, and he just snapped that shot. And that's, nobody's ever seen that picture before. That's an unknown picture of Janis Joplin. And I think it's just great from that era, 1968, or dog in the back seat. Just kind of captures the whole late 60s thing to me. This is a uh, picture of that Packard over there. Not the car, but an identical car. And this was at an auto show in 1908. And it's, it says, taking the minister home. And it says, Packard, the honeymoon car. And you got the happy couple here and the minister's in the back seat, which they call the mother-in-law seat. And he doesn't look like a real happy guy to me, but that's a pretty cool picture, I think. This is a great shot uh, done by uh, Dave Friedman. And that's Carol Shelby and Steve McQueen down on the Princeton uh, Avenue address uh, where Shelby was in the early days, and that's 1963. And uh, McQueen's acting like he's going to buy a 289. I don't know why he never did, but uh, I think that's just a very iconic shot of what was going on with Shelby in those days. So I'm going to show you some Ed Roth stuff. Uh, Ed Roth's shop was down the street from my dad's shop in Maywood, California. And, uh, I'm sure most everybody knows, but he was kind of this crazy beatnik artist guy. And I always thought he was so creative. And so in, uh, I had this painting commissioned by a guy named Jimmy Cleveland, and he was one of Ed Roth's protégés. And Roth was kind of like Disney. Disney had a lot of artists working for him. And in any event, Jimmy painted this and then, uh, they were at car shows and he'd paint it in the booth while Ed was selling t-shirts and doing his thing. And <clears throat> at the end, uh, Ed signed it, but before he would sign it, he said, you gotta make my nose bigger. So he, he, 
he repainted his nose bigger, and they, re they misspelled Malibu, so they had her fix the, the spelling on Malibu. And then when Ed died, uh, Jimmy painted this of all the, the characters around Ed's grave, and uh, it was an honor to me that he painted me as this guy, the coat hanger man. I'm in the wire business, and so uh, I don't know if Ed ever gave a name to the coat hanger man, but that's supposed to be me along with Rat Fink and Trixie and all these crazy monster characters from the 60s. And then finally in the big picture category, um, I found this recently and I think it's just great. Uh, we spent a lot of time up in Carmel for the car show and the races and all that. And this is a picture of a car very similar to this Simplex coming down Highway 1, which was a dirt road, uh, and Carmel is this way. And uh, you see the sign. And here's the horse and buggy from the photographer parked. And the photographer's out here taking a shot of the car coming down the road. And a guy named Pat Hathaway collected all these photos of the area, these vintage photos, and he recently passed away. So I was really fortunate to get that photograph. If you want to go into the junk room, I'll show you a bunch of junk over here. So there's some good stuff in here and then there's just some junk in here, like I was saying, but it all has some special meaning to me and has no, uh, you know, there's the value of it's of little importance to me. It's just that uh, I think it's special stuff. Um, these are a set of Burma shave signs. And you know, when you, in the sixties, when you, uh, you drove down uh, route 66 or any highway, they'd have these Burma shave signs every hundred yards. And it says within this veil of toil and sin, your head grows bald, but not your chin. Use Burma shave. And Burma shave was a shaving cream stuff. And there's collectors of that, that stuff. And there's all kinds of sayings and it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of French artwork here that's, uh, I think, very well executed. Uh, French really had their act together with automotive design and art early on. Uh, this is a original Cobra team jacket and shirt from uh, John Collins, a friend of mine who used to do prep on my race car stuff. Uh, one of them just sold, Phil Hills just sold at uh, David Gooding's auction. So I feel very lucky to own this one because John was a special guy to me. Uh, this is just a bunch of junk that, I don't know how it got here, a lot of it, but it's here. <clears throat> um, and some of these things have been given to me by friends and uh, people I know, which is really, really kind and some stuff I've just accumulated over 50 years. Um, Dan Gurney was a very special friend of mine. Uh, I always said, I always told him, it's pretty cool when your, your childhood hero becomes your friend. And uh, he was a very special person. And there's some Dan Gurney photos and some things here that are pretty great, I think. Um, picture of, uh, Lucy with Richard Petty and Felipe Massa, and uh, there's Dan and Evie Gurney. Uh, and everybody says it, and it's really true. It's all about the people. And uh, we've met some really great people with, through the car world. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, our friend Sandra Button uh, at Pebble Beach. That's the car that Barney Oldfield was in, in that big photo that, uh, I got to uh, restore and show at Pebble Beach, and that's a pretty special thing for me. Um, just a lot of other memorabilia kind of stuff. This is a 1915 Creeters popcorn wagon, and the Creeters company just built some magnificent early popcorn wagons, machines, and that sort of thing. 
and I've always really appreciated the quality of the workmanship and uh, this is a, an example of that. This is Ed Roth's Surfite and this was a car that I was absolutely in love with when I was in junior high school and I mentioned building all those little models. Uh, this is a Ravel model of this car that I built when I was like, I don't know, how old are you in junior high, 13? And I liked surfing and hot rods and Ed Roth. And when this thing came out at the model shop, I was beside myself. And <clears throat> they, it was so small, it's made out of a Mini Cooper. And it was so small that um, they had to provide something else with it. So they built this shack. And this car has been to Australia, it's been to Honolulu. It's been to the East Coast in not car shows, but in surf culture exhibits, surfing art. In the last show, they built a shack to replicate what was in the model. And I think they did a great job with Ed's feet and the whole deal. Anyway, at the end of the show, they gave me the shack, which was very, very kind. And this was Ed's idea of a personal surfing vehicle, which is really ingenious. Um, you drive it down to the beach and you jump out and you've got your surfboard right there and you go surfing. It was in uh, a Annette Funicello movie, uh, beach blanket bingo, little vignette shot of it. And uh, I think it's just a great part of the, the mid 60s surfing hot rod era. So again, just a lot more photos, stuff, uh, and that's kind of the, the whole show here. So appreciate everybody um, bearing through all the stories. At least half of them are true. And uh, I'm appreciative of everything Peterson Museum does. Keep up the good work, team. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Be sure and hit the like button and subscribe.